When I was when I was when I was dedicated to the cause of Lucifer, I was at that point a seventh generation wish. I was laying there, practically naked, and I had her hold me as if I was me. I couldn't talk, I couldn't open my eyes, I, I believe my eyes were rolling back in my head. There was evidence of human sacrifice on this fight. One of my first questions I asked to God, is there evidence of human sacrifice on this fight? Yes, we found a man with his fingers like God, who was a rich, rich sacrifice. guys we're back on conspiracy normal it's been about another week and we have in the studio it's just myself and mr producer rob say hello to everybody rob hello hello everyone <laughs> what's up rob how's it going guys <laughs> well we got to we got the guests bleeding through already <laughs> yep. well if, you, done, rob. <laughs> if you guys uh don't know and there's probably, unfortunately, a lot of people that don't know this anymore, but November 22nd of this year is the 53rd anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. And I wanted to do a show uh, for a while about it. Uh, it's not been a topic that we've covered too much on this show, frankly, because... S- uh, I know I I know a lot about it, and it's kind of like a kind of an exhausted field for me in a way. So I didn't really want to cover it too much, but I felt it important to go ahead and cover it uh, today because I was thinking about it, and I have two perfect guests to come and talk about it, and that is Craig Ciccone and John Tinney. And guys, welcome to back to Conspiracy Normal. Welcome back, for both of you guys. Thank you very much, Adam. <laughs> this yeah, is a, thank you for having us. Thank you. <laughs> this is actually uh, both of you guys' third time on the show, incidentally. So yep. it's uh, we we get uh, the price for the price of one. You guys are in the third show club now, both of you. <laughs> and what do we get? Uh, I don't know. Maybe like, <laughs> maybe a smoking jacket or something. No. <laughs> we'll, we'll have Luke draw smoke, you guys a, a picture. Smoking gun jacket. <laughs> <laughs> smoking <laughs> gun jacket. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But John, uh, I, I, before we get started in on the JFK stuff, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, about Ghost Stalkers. You know, that was one uh, probably one of my favorite shows, uh, paranormal themed shows, because I just frankly had gotten bored with a lot of those kind of shows by the time it came on. But I thought it was pretty unique in the way that it did things with the whole first person camera and not having anybody there with the person. And uh, I was kind of bummed out that it got canceled. So what uh, what what happened there with it? Uh, there's a, a multitude of factors involved in all that stuff. Uh, but the, the reality of the situation, and I don't have any secrets about this, and I, I get yelled at a lot from networks, but because I talk about stuff I'm not supposed to, you know, they make us sign non-disclosure agreements, but I've never been a fan of those in any way, shape, or form. So, uh, But, you know, it's, it's strange. One of the contributing factors was actually told to me by someone at the network, which is very telling about all television shows. Uh, the person told me, you know, one of the reasons that we don't think the show can go on is because you seem to be slightly too intellectual for the audience. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, no way. And this, this, yes, this was actually told. This is what was told to me by someone. They said this is an I, it's not verbatim, but it's close. They said when people watch reality television shows, they want to watch someone who's dumb so that they will feel smart. If they see someone smart, then they feel dumb and they won't watch. 
Well, that's and extreme. So that, that's extremely revealing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I was saying that's a that's a that's a real understanding of what network heads and producers are looking at when they make these shows. And so the option actually came up for us to do more episodes later on down the road, and they wanted to tweak some things. And I said, you know what? It's been a year and a half. I I don't like to go back and and I don't want to redo something I've already done. I don't want to revisit that. I would be a different person. Chad would be a different person. So I might as well just find another project. Yeah. And we're not going to dumb it down for your convenience. Exactly. So. Well, why don't you just grow like a beard and get like a Confederate flag shirt and just, you know, walk around the walk around an abandoned place. Just, just uh, acting like a hick or something, you know, (laughs) <laughs> they 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 tried to do that. It lasted one season. There there was a kind of hillbilly haunted yeah, paranormal yeah. show. <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of where I was going with that. Do you still have contact with Chad? Oh, I talk to him all the time. I talk to Nick and Chad and and everybody all the time. And we're always throwing ideas around. But I would much rather. I'm trying to position myself. In the, in the sense with these networks, because they want to work with me, I want to pr- position myself as the producer so I can allow people to have free reign. Mm-hmm. If you have yeah, a yeah. producer, if you have a producer who doesn't want to twist an arm, then you can start getting shows where people are actually being themselves and saying things that matter and helping people construct ideas together instead of forcing someone's agenda down your throat. Right. 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 Yeah, I, I just thought it was such a good show, just from the way that it was executed, and some of the things that you that you said, and some of the topics that you got into. It was more real, I thought, and more realistic than many of the other shows that were out there. And you guys got some amazing, amazing evidence. We got, yeah, we got amazing evidence, and we did something that was, you know, the whole process of kind of baby stepping people into different stuff, especially with ghost shows. <laughs> And I don't know how many people picked up on it, but on, on ghost stalkers, one of the things that was really important to me was I don't want to do an evidence breakdown at the end of the show. I don't want to sit here and say like, you know, this place is or isn't haunted. The show was basically about here are two different people going to an allegedly haunted place. Let's see how they, how differently they react to it. And the, the formula for a ghost show is let's go into a place and see and prove if it's haunted or not. And I didn't want to do that. That's, that that's not my job to prove if something is haunted. We don't even know if anything can be haunted. So, you know, it was more about watching these kind of characters, Chad and I kind of evolve and what our thinking processes are. And and again, I think that is slightly like the network said, you know, that's slightly too intellectual for the crowd they're shooting for. Yeah. Because some of it was, some of it you could really say was psychological, right? Because you could go in there and then Chad could go in there and you both would have maybe two different reactions to the same kind of stimuli. And maybe his reaction was a little more, uh, overreactive than yours. And then at other times yours might've been more more overreactive than his. And so there would have been, uh, so it was interesting to see that not only could it not just be like a ghost or that there's actually something there, but like maybe that uh, that the place isn't haunted at all, but it's the psychological and the buildup that sure. that you're experiencing. Yeah, there was there was one episode at Holmesburg Prison uh, where I thought that I, I was having like a heart attack or something inside yeah. of the prison, mm-hmm. and w- the way that that's you know all all television shows have to be edited to a certain degree, and and we have no control over that. But there's a there was a huge portion, which I thought was interesting, is once Chad gets me outside, there's a conversation that he and I had, which was never heard on the show because it takes away from the quote-unquote ghost part of it. But I'm talking to Chad about, you know, we've been on the road for 20 days. I haven't been eating correctly. We're not sleeping right. We're not taking care of ourselves. This is the type of thing that we have to watch out for. And so it's this very telling moment of, you know, the reality is, you know, you don't have to be afraid of ghosts. You have to be afraid of how you're treating yourself mentally and physically when you're doing these kind of things, when you're staying up for 20 hours, six days in a row, right? you know, but it's much, it's much better television to, 
make me attacked by a ghost or yeah. something like that. Which is an abnormal thing to do, right? Because normally that's what not what you're going to do. If you go on an investigation and maybe it's say, like, say maybe you've been you've been working, yes, but you've also been gotten been getting plenty of sleep. But then when you're on this, right. you're on some kind of weird production schedule and you're not eating right, you're not sleeping right. And so it's a little abnormal than it would be just going out and doing something on the weekend. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm an insomniac. I'm sure Craig is as well still. Uh, Nighthawk, uh, yeah. We are, we are Nighthawks, absolutely. <laughs> but, but when you're filming a show, especially a paranormal show, because you're filming you know, a huge chunk of it at night, our filming schedule, we were six days on, one day off. And so when we were filming for six days, our filming schedule was from noon until 7 o'clock in the morning for six days in a row. Whew. So... You, you do that for six days and you're trying to catch naps, you know, whenever there, someone is there during the day doing a camera setup, you're leaned against the wall trying to grab 15 minutes before they call you to come and do a walk into a room. And then at night you're there by yourself, you know, at least Chad and I were, we're, we're there completely by ourselves. And so you're having to like run around inside the RV and make sure all the cameras are working. That's if you're not in the location, if you're in the location, you're climbing around, you're going in tunnels, you're walking up and down stairs, trying to make sure you've got eight cameras that you're in charge of making sure they're all filming. And so when you do that for six days in a row, you know, going 17 hours a day, you you tend to get a little burned out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can I, I can imagine. You sure you weren't going through like Guantanamo Bay like torture there? <laughs> it, it seems like it sometimes, and and you know the the pay isn't great for that either. I think yeah. Chad and I broke it down once to be we were making like two dollars an hour or something. Like that. Oh god! <laughs> but it's such a glam it's such a glamorous life. Oh yes, yes, absolutely. As I make as I make another baked potato for dinner. <laughs> mm, baked potatoes. Well, guys, let's get with no, with no butter. <laughs> with no butter. I want to get on to JFK. Let's talk about the JFK assassination. And the reason why I got this idea to do this was because I had watched the mini series eleven twenty two sixty three. Mm-hmm. Which is the Steve based off the Stephen King novel, and mm-hmm. very interesting miniseries. You know, of course, it has to do with fantastic things like time travel. But uh, King, you know, he did a lot of study about the Kennedy assassination in preparing to write the book, and what he actually came up with the whole idea that that uh, Oswald acted alone, mm-hmm. and I. I thought to myself, you know, the, uh, how he could have come up with that. With that, uh, one of the, the re- I think the reason that he did, and the reason that he looked at that, and I will start off with this, is that he was looking at Oswald as being the possible, and I will stress possible shooter that the guy that shot at General Walker in Dallas, mm-hmm. I think, in May of 1963. Yes. So I want to ask, you know, either one of you guys could take this both, whatever. You know, was that Oswald? Or if it wasn't, do we actually, or if it, do we have any proof that it was Oswald? Or could it have been somebody else? And by the way, that's where uh, that famous picture comes in, right? Where he's holding the communist newspaper. Yeah, the backyard photographs uh, where he's, uh, he's holding the rifle that he used, yes, to, to shoot at uh, General Walker, and then of course uh, 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 President Kennedy and, and Governor Conley, and then of course the, he's, he's holstering the pistol that uh, authorities claim that he yeah. used to kill Officer Tippett. Um, yeah, no, the, the the evidence against Oswald, as far as which I thought was interesting, because he's on trial for uh, President Kennedy's assassination. And here they're trying to tie him to other things, as if to say that if he's capable of doing this, then it's a logical conclusion that he did this. Right. If he was so unhinged, now, which, which again, is yeah. interesting, because he's taking a pot shot at a John Bircher, a right-wing radical, yes. then takes a pot shot at one of the most liberal presidents we've ever had. Right. That, just, that, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, his ideology must have been all over the place. Yeah, but, those um, those flyers that uh, that were said to have been that showed JFK's face on them and it said "wanted for treason" that were passed around Dallas. That was said to have exactly. been General Walker that was behind that. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, 
So the so the evidence was was very thin, um, and it was never proven even scientifically. Um, it was it was the only thing that 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 um, really it, um, uh, convicted Oswald in the minds of the Warren Commission members was the testimony, of course, of Marina Oswald, and we could even talk about that and 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 how talk about exhausted she was and you know mm-hmm. sensory deprivation and and intimidation that uh, her entire testimony could have, could be thrown out i mean she was the very first witness for the warren commission when it's a law that says uh you don't have to you're not compelled to testify against your spouse but of course she was front and center and yep i'll give you anything you want to know just don't deport me mm-hmm. don't don't send mm-hmm. me back to the soviet union so uh, but but yeah, King. I mean, King says that he does a lot of research in getting back to your your subject or your topic of of the early researchers uh, or the assassination community is is basically what we call it. Um, I think two very important things have to be uh, remembered. One is that the, the public did not have access to the Zapruder film, the color. Um, film shot by an, an amateur dressmaker. It, it was the first time it was, it was shown to the public was 14 years later when a copy of a copy of a copy was bootlegged out of the National Archives and then shown on Geraldo Rivera's Goodnight America. Had the, had the public seen the Zapruder film the next day, there is no way that the, that the, uh, that the narrative that Oswald did it and did it alone from behind would have been even plausible to, to anyone. Uh, the other thing is, is that is that you had a public that was still reeling from this assassination, so they were emotionally, uh, well, they were scared. Number one, and uh, you know they were in mourning, they were in shock, so they they were going to tend to believe what their institution said. And when the New York Times and Time Life Magazine, who bought the Zapruder film by the way and locked it away in a vault in New York, uh. When when they endorsed the Warren Commission's conclusions that Oswald did it and did it alone, people weren't going to weren't going to question that. They didn't have anything on which to base it. So that's where you have these, at the time, these young lawyers, publishers, and activists uh, doing the research or doing the work that the government should have done from day one. And that includes, I would say that the very first was Mark Lane, because Mark Lane testified before the Warren Commission on March 2nd, 1964. And he requested that he that the Warren Commission allow him to defend Oswald's rights in the courtroom. That is, if there was evidence against Oswald presented even uh, either uh, physical evidence or, or testimonial evidence, that Mark Lane be able to cross-examine them. Right. And of course, the Warren Commission turned them down, or turned him down. But his testimony was extremely telling because, from November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, to the time that he testified in March, he had been doing he had been invest uh, he had been doing investigating investigative work. He had been interviewing witnesses, and and he knew already some of the um, impossible evidence that the government stacked against Oswald, and he was prepared to to show that in, in court before the Warren Commission. So so I, I would say that Mark Lane was the first, and then, and then other people like Vincent Salandria, who, again, didn't ever publish a major work. He simply, he was a lawyer, he was a teacher, and he wrote a series of articles after he had interviewed Arlen Specter, who was a junior counsel for the Warren Commission and the um, creator of the single bullet theory. He, he, he interviewed... Arlen Specter, and based on that alone, wrote a scathing report about Arlen Specter and the single bullet theory, and that was you know in 1965. So you've got this wave of 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 critics of the Warren Commission coming out, but not publishing anything until 1966. So, so um, I, thought, I think I think Craig, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Salandria, I think that was that he actually confronted Specter at a town hall meeting in front of people. Exactly. Exactly, but but the inspector agreed to meet him afterwards, and he did. And over coffee, you know, he basically, he basically, inspector basically made an ass of himself, and you know, and Salandria 
you know, wrote a, wrote a scathing article that everyone else used to base their research off of. So, <clears throat> and then another very important uh, researcher, researcher to come out very early was a young woman by the name of Sylvia Marr, who, although her, her book, um, Accessories After the Fact, wasn't published until 1967, in 1965, she, well, it actually it probably took her from 1964 to 1965, she created an index for all 26 volumes of the Warren Commission's testimony and exhibits. Because, yes, ladies and gentlemen, they published 26 volumes right. without an index. <laughs> right. So was it, wasn't one of those, the study of Oswald's pubic hairs? Wasn't that exactly. actually in there? Exactly. Uh, yes, and, and Jack Ruby's mother's dental records from 1939. And Marina Oswald's sewing pattern, you know, sewing kit patterns and, you know, just just anything to fill 26 volumes. But without an index, somebody would have to be willing to read all 26 volumes. And as and as um, Earl Warren, Earl Warren uh, as Alan Dulles, one of the members of the Warren Commission, said, uh, we're not worried because nobody reads. Yeah. Now, now when, you, you know. Uh, a few academics no, when, will, but the public reads very little, so don't be worried. And, and when you talk about those 26 volumes with no indices that they fill up with absolutely everything, how many pages in those uh, 26 volumes was dedicated to the examination of the Kennedy autopsy x-rays and photographs? Exactly. None. None. <laughs> huh. so because even, it's because, the, because even, even the autopsy, uh, the, the pathologists, the three pathologists who did the autopsy didn't even look at them. They didn't hmm. look at them until 1966. Hmm. So yeah, why would they be in the, in the, <laughs> in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, yeah, they have important so, things like cross knit patterns in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So yeah, so 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 it, it may seem like because publishers weren't willing to go against the government at that time, uh, it may seem like there it was a very quiet, you know, rumbling of of dissent. But that's that's just not true. So people knew that it, that something was very very wrong from the very beginning, and you had. You know, Mark Lane testifying, you had Sylvia Marr, you know, uh, indexing the 26 volumes. You had Harold Weisberg, you know, on a, on a poultry farm in Maryland, you know, typing his manuscript, which was called Whitewash, which was published in 1966. So <clears throat> there were a lot of busy people trying to get, trying to get the government to reopen and re-examine the case. But not, they failed the first time. But not very widely known, I guess, to the general public. Right. Because you'd have to be, a, you'd, you would have to be a, a, a critic of the Warren Commission to even know who they were. Yeah. And, and you know, to go to town hall meetings where, where they appeared a lot of times. Uh, even Mark Lane appeared on, on Frontline with uh, William Buckley Jr. So, um, which was, which was a great episode, but... Yeah, I'd say uh, and, he and, was the and, most and, visible, I think, of all of them. Mark Lane, yeah, yeah. yeah, at the beginning, yes. And you have to remember, too, I mean, to that point of, you know, that, that Warren Commission's quote about, you know, no one is willing to read. When you have someone like Harold Weisberg, who, you know, in, starts in 63 on that poultry farm and ends up collecting over, you know, 200,000 papers on, on the case, it's... Yeah. it's I mean, there are people out there who are willing to read, uh, yeah, but absolutely. I, I, you know, the, 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 what becomes problematic is we've, it, and you see it starting around 63. I mean, maybe a little bit sooner, maybe you see it starting with the McCarthy trials because that was such a, uh, a, a, a huge kind of, you know, media storm in the fifties. But I mean, you look at what, when, when we're talking about issues now, the major issue that we're speaking about in 2016 is the media and how they can yeah. send something. Right. Right. But still, on, in the same breath, how important they are, how absolutely uh, integral they are uh, still to this day. So, um, you know, as, as the watchdogs. But but I, I find it just interesting that that you you mentioned Harold Weisberg who yes who was who successfully sued the government actually for the executive transcripts of the Warren Commission when they met in secret in executive sessions he sued 
issued the FBI for their documents. I mean, he he was was quite the um, liberator of, as John said, you know, just millions and millions of documents that we would never have seen otherwise. But then you've got somebody like Gerald Ford, who served on the Warren Commission, turning around and saying, well, no, he's wrong. Okay, well, he did the reading. Gerald, did you ever read what was actually in your own report? <laughs> right. Did you read the 900 pages? Did you write the 900 pages? No, you didn't. You left it to the junior staffers. They wrote it. Yeah. And, and based on preconceived conclusions that the FBI and the Secret Service made in December, mm-hmm. three weeks after the assassination, according to the FBI and the Secret Service, their uh, investigation was over. Oswald did it and did it alone. <sighs> So they based their entire report on that. Well, here's a question to ask about, because, you know, big fan of the movie JFK, and I I do want to get to Garrison here in a little bit. But, you know, what is in the Warren Commission that, being that this this 26 volumes are non-indexed, at least till this lady indexed it, you said, in 66? 65, yeah. So if, so when it, it came out and... There were these. Uh, what 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 stood out to some of the conspiracy researchers that was actually in the Warren Commission? Things that just did not make sense to the official story. Well, the the, the most well, Craig, for Craig before people, you take the, yeah. Craig before you take that over, let me just say this too. We yeah. we also have to keep in mind that you know the fantastic work that the Warren Commission did, <laughs> and I you know obviously say that with my tongue in my cheek. But right. the, the fact the fact that the fact that they also choose to to cherry pick and release a nine hundred page copy uh, right. to the general public, uh, which yeah. you know does nothing but make their case. That should be the first warning to researchers. When you can take something that's that many volumes and that many pages and that much information, and you can condense it down to nine hundred and twelve pages, you know a great majority of which are photographs, and and it only point in a singular direction uh, right. and there's still mistakes within that 900 pages right. that right. is a leading clue yeah. Now, yeah i'm sorry craig go ahead how many pages yeah, is in all 26 volumes just for perspective uh that's a very good question i don't uh, um <clears throat> 20 20 000? wow I, I don't know that i ever Took the time to find out how many pages altogether <laughs> in, in all twenty six volumes. Hmm. Um, a lot. How's that? Yeah, uh, more but, than nine hundred. They all, all absolutely. And to and to piggyback on what John was saying, um, not only was it was it, it a, the report a distillation of so much information to nine hundred pages, it started with its conclusions. Now, yeah. when was the last time you read a book that started with its end? Uh, maybe the nine eleven right. commission. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because <laughs> it was made up of the surviving members of the Warren Commission. Yeah. No, and 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 that's the point. And, and I think that that um, because it, it um, as researchers got a hold of these volumes and started reading them, they read the testimony. And I think as I published a da- database of witnesses <laughs> because there there wasn't one, um, and I think that I've I've. Um, categorized, I think, uh, 423 witnesses where the Warren Commission called 52. Hmm. And one of the points that I make in my book is is that the questions that weren't asked were just as telling as the questions that were. And a lot of the criticism began when they realized just how leading the questions were to each and every witness. So not only were the questions leading, but of course the answers will be um, they didn't ask questions. Um, they berated witnesses and told them that they were wrong. Um, and so it was the contradictions within the testimony of some of the key witnesses that people started creating timelines for Oswald. Could Oswald have been in the sixth floor based on all of these other employees of the Texas School Book Depository that worked with him, knew him, knew his face, and knew where he was? And so just those kind of contradictions got people then to ask even more questions. Um, and one of the most revealing things in the, um, the 26 volumes is the FBI's own ballistics tests that were there to prove that Oswald did it, 
but in fact proved that he couldn't have done it. Hmm. Um, it was the ballistic test that they did in Quantico, Virginia. They took uh, 6.5 millimeter, uh, millimeter uh, ammunition, took Oswald's rifle, and they test fired bullets into three different surfaces. One into cotton wadding, so it struck nothing. Then they shot through the rib of a goat, so through the carcass of a goat. Then they shot through a wrist of a cadaver, and they did three different tests, three different rounds of the same test. They were trying to simulate the, the wounds, the non-fatal wounds, to both President Kennedy and Governor Conley. So the cotton wadding would represent Kennedy's neck, the rib okay. of a goat, obviously Conley's rib, and then um, the wrist of a cadaver, Conley's wrist. And as the test bullets are shown, they showed the best test bullets. And the one that hit the, the, the rib of goat widened completely, you know, widened quite, quite significantly. And the, the lead core uh, was protruding down at the base. And then, of course, the one that went through a wrist was smashed at the nose. And, and the, the lead core was really protruding. So you could see that Commission Exhibit 399, or the magic bullet, the bullet that they said went through both men. Nine layers of flesh, seven la- you know, or nine layers of cloth, seven layers of flesh, and breaking two bones in Conley's body came right. out unscathed through their own um, ballistic test. They proved that it was that he couldn't have done it. Yeah. So the Warren Commission was was never about did Oswald do it. It was always about how did he do it. Mm-hmm. So they start with the preconceived notion that he did do it. So how did he do it? And that's what that's what the entire report is about. <clears throat> and, and to that to that point, uh, I just looked through my PDFs. The uh, twenty six volumes. I'll go. I'll get back. But I wanted to get back to that original question. I looked through my PDFs. The original twenty six volumes is just over eleven thousand pages. Okay. So the, right. yeah. So the the book that was released, the uh, the special commission report, the nine hundred pages. That's about eight percent of the information that's in there. But to what Craig was saying, you know, finding your conclusion. And then and and then making the facts fit. This is where you get things where okay, we know that bullets don't traditionally work like this. So let's go to physics professors and ask them: right, Can right. a bullet ever? Can a bullet ever do this? Yes. Okay, that's the jet effect. That's why a head would move in that motion. Okay. Now, can we reproduce it? No, but the math says that it does work like that sometimes. So sure. then then you get into this this realm of speculative science, which, you know, we're in a very speculative realm. I dealing aside from conspiracies, dealing with things like ghosts and stuff like that. You know, I have to keep in mind that when it comes to the science that people are using to prove the reality of something that, you know, there are only 10,000, uh, you know, theoretical physicists in the world. And they agree that 97% of the universe is made up of dark matter, which is an untestable, unprovable hypothesis. Um, which means that they don't understand 97% of known reality. And yet we look to them to tell us what is clear fact and what isn't. And that's not what science is meant to do. It's meant to give you a best guess. And if your best guess is something that is impl- that is not Occam's razor, I mean, you have to start looking at what is your best guess. And that's not what happened right. with the Warren Commission. Hmm. Well, in a lot of cases, they didn't even use science. They, they you know, uh, Arlen Specter and and his and the birth of the single bullet theory was out of desperation. He ran out of bullets. It had nothing to do with arriving on the heels of science. You know that the autopsy, you know, uh, determined that that the angles were this and thus, and and the distance was this, and and you know, because of that, we we have arrived at at the single bullet theory. It was. We 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 committed ourselves to three bullets and three bullets only, and one was obviously responsible for Kennedy's death. It went through his head, so that's one. Mm-hmm. One missed the motorcade completely and struck a curb and hit a bystander down at the opposite end of Dealey Plaza. That's two. So now one bullet remains if Oswald is to be the only uh, assassin. One bullet remains to go through both men and had inflicted on fatal injuries. Hmm. Okay, we'll make that work. Okay. Yeah, we'll make that work. <laughs> and so is born a bullet named Magic. <laughs> exactly. And that with, bullet. With, with, that with bullet. No tissue, with no tissue, no blood, no deformation whatsoever. Right. Um, and, and even doubt as to what stretcher it popped out of. Yeah. 
And uh, although missing missing very little content, leaving a lot of content in, in Governor Connolly's wrist. No, oh, absolutely. To the day he died, he still had fragments of metal in his wrist. And, of course, immediately a petition went out to Mrs. Conley once John died. <clears throat> saying, uh, I remember would you this. Please, yeah. Would you please allow even, even a partial autopsy, just an autopsy on his wrist, to remove those fragments, which we can then take the fragments that were removed in 63, weigh them, and then weigh the magic bullet against it. And one way or another, talk about science, talk about being able to conclusively state something. And, of course, she said no. Hmm. So, hmm. another, another you know, buried artifact that, that, could, that could end this, this whole debate. Yeah, that's a good point, because the, the, the magic bullet, as you see it, it has one little dent, I think, towards the front of it. And then there's... Yes. The, and then... But supposedly, where there's no fragments, obviously taken off the bullet, then right, Connolly's. Right. Yeah, I've never thought about that, Craig. <laughs> I've never actually yeah, thought and, about it. There's so and, much and, to and this that I've never actually thought really about is. that. And and some <laughs> of the and some of the uh, and some of the experts have since said that that little dent that you see in, in a lot of the photographs yeah. uh, could have been made simply by cloth. Right. So if yep. if a bullet can be dented like that, or or you know. Um, marked like that by cloth then imagine what it, it does through flesh and through you know and through bone i mean yeah i, I, Conley's, I always like Conley's roof I, was shattered so i always yeah, like so i always like the i always like the idea that uh, uh the small deformation and magic bullet uh could have been made by when it was dropped out of an agent's pocket onto the ground oh, he sure. discovered <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> Otherwise, it would have been absolutely pristine. But yeah. Oh, look so, what I found. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that that was that was basically the the uh, chain of evidence as as it was as it was produced. Well, so, well all kinds um, of another, all kinds of things right? were not followed. I mean, like the the car, the the limousine itself was taken away and cleaned. Almost the fact that his body was taken away. That's against yeah. the, the law. Yeah. Exactly, John. I, I was just about to say what what a lot of people forget is that in 1963 it was not a federal crime to kill the president. So the second that bullet ripped through Kennedy's head, he was just another John Doe. And Texas law said that an autopsy had to be done in the county where the death took place before the the body could be moved. Right. And even and even as John Kennedy was was breathing his last breath in Parkland Hospital, Secret Service agents, FBI agents were cleaning out the car. So right there, there's an there's an immediate destruction of evidence. And then of course the evidence was 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 uh, you know swifted away back to Washington, where where the outcome of whatever examination was made on the car or the body could be controlled, and it absolutely was. Hmm. So what does that tell you that 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 the the men who were in charge of this important, this crucial, this uh, monumental autopsy were basically Mollary and Curley? Yeah, they were not board certified forensic pathologists. They were clinical anatomic pathologists. They taught pathology. They taught how to dissect bodies and take samples for microscopic and, study. And and not meaning for this to sound any way, shape, or form. But it's going to because it, it does have a, a, a ring to um, truth to it. Who better to per, to to work on a gunshot victim than doctors in Texas? De- Texas, I would assume, sees a lot of gunshots at their hospitals. You, you would think. Uh, you would think. <laughs> you would think. <laughs> but but of course, send them to Bethesda to, to people who are completely unfamiliar with yeah. with that, that type of that type of wound. Well, then it's in right. control. It's in, it was in control of the military because they were all military doctors, right? You're right. Yeah. Because it You're was right. a navy. So, I think it was a na- Wasn't it a navy installation that he was taken to? It, it was, and 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 uh, the and the and the myth goes that it was it was Mrs. Kennedy's uh, decision to for him to be taken to Bethesda because he himself served in the navy. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we don't know if that's true or not. Well, we don't. I yeah. mean, for sure. I, I mean, um, I don't know how much control she had over it, other than just the you know the the presence of the Kennedys and the and the and the you know uh, every um, concession was going to be made for the Kennedy family. We didn't want to you know hurt them anymore or or pain them anymore. So whatever you want to do, we'll do, regardless of what the law is, regardless of of what's best for the actual victim himself. Mm-hmm. 
But uh, Dr. Earl Rose, who was the uh, medical examiner in Dallas County, he did Oswald's autopsy. He did Tippett's autopsy. He did Jack Ruby's autopsy. And every one of them were complete and thorough with gunshot wound diagrams, charts, x-rays, photographs, completely documented. And then, of course, when he was finished with the autopsies, he sent copies to the attorney general, to, you know, the, the prosecutor, um, and his own office. So, so Craig, are you, are, you, are you telling us that, that uh, those exact same procedures were made with the president of the United States? Uh, I don't think so, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. His well, were never examined, the car was never examined, and when the pathologist said that he was struck from, from the right and above the, his body, there are four buildings that were above and behind President Kennedy at the time. Yeah. So, and we get back to the single bullet theory. The single bullet theory starts with President Kennedy's uh, neck wound. And at the night, the night of the autopsy, the pathologists concluded that the bullet had not traversed his body because the wound in the back was, they attempted to probe that, that wound to try to find a path through President Kennedy's body. Uh, uh, so it didn't, it, it didn't it, go through and through. It did not at the night okay. of the autopsy. It was only after the autopsy was over, Kennedy was embalmed and lying in state that Dr. Humes called uh, one of the doctors, the attending doctors at, at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, and said, okay, you saw President Kennedy immediately after he was shot. What did you see? And he said, we saw a wound in his neck. Whereas Dr. Humes concluded that all he saw was a trache- tracheotomy wound. The, 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 the doctors... The doctors in Parkland had extended the bullet wound into a tracheotomy to put an endotracheal tube into Kennedy's throat to try to, to, try to help him breathe. Mm-hmm. So they didn't do it maliciously. They didn't do it. They simply did it because there was already a hole there. They simply extended the margins of the wound and then put the endotracheal tube in. And when the body arrived at Bethesda and Dr. Hume saw that wound, he just thought it was a tracheotomy. Yeah. He didn't know there was a bullet wound there. So the night of the autopsy, the wound in the back doesn't go through. He sees a tracheotomy in the front, figured that, hey, it fell out when they did closed cardiac massage on President Kennedy because they had heard from a Secret Service agent that a bullet was recovered on a stretcher at Parkland. So they just assumed it was Kennedy's. Right. A bullet, the bullet had worked its way out and out onto the stretcher. But then when Humes talked to Dr. Kemp, and learned, or Dr. Perry, I'm sorry, Dr. Uh, Dr. Malcolm Perry, and learned of the wound in the throat, uh, Humes, I, I could just see the look on his face. Because now he has to write a report, an autopsy report, based on a wound he never saw and never examined. Hmm. So as Oswald emerged as the assassin from behind, then now this bullet wound actually does go through, went through the tracheotomy wound, and, you know, again, it, was no, it wasn't science that, that provided us that, because Dr. Humes didn't dissect the neck and track a bullet wound from the back to the front. He simply connected the dots and said, well, that's, that's how it must have been, because right. that's, what, that's, that's what we need to... to he made that, uh, uh, made that assumption. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It had to be that way. If Oswald was shooting from behind, it all starts with the premise of Oswald shooting from behind. Well, if Oswald was shooting from behind, the bullet must have gone through. Wasn't there in the Warren Commission report, uh, Lee Bowers, the guy that was in the, I guess he was in some kind of little station right behind the grassy knoll. It was, and, it was a control tower because, yeah. because there, was a, there were railroads uh, that, that went traversed um, Dealey Plaza and what we call the overpass. So the streets uh, in you know in Dealey Plaza converge in the under uh, you know underneath the underpass, and that's that's a railroad trestle. So um, yes, there was a there was a control tower in the parking lot of the Texas School Book Depository, and so he could see behind the picket fence that lined part of of the grassy knoll. And didn't he see some guys back there? He saw three. He saw people driving in and out. Mm-hmm. Uh, what he, and, and again, this is, this is in the record. This is, right. and, and a lot of, a lot of what made a lot of, uh, early researchers suspicious was that he, you know, he said that he saw people driving in and out with what appeared to be microphones up to their mouths 
and then saw one guy standing at the picket fence with a toolbox. Mm-hmm. Like he was a railroad worker. And something out of the corner of his eye distracted him from, from watching the motorcade come down Elm Street, and he couldn't tell what it was. He, he said he was just unable to describe whether it was a puff of smoke or it was a flash or something. And then that guy who he saw behind the fence then walked away. Yeah. So, you know, but, but of course he was killed, uh, two years later, uh, in a one car accident right. when he drove his car into an abutment. Right. One of the many mysterious deaths in one of the, one of the scores of mysterious deaths. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I want to, I want to ask you guys about George DeMorenschild. Here's an interesting person here. One of the more, one of the most fascinating characters. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this is more of kind of like the, the, just his very strange association with Oswald, because here is Oswald, this supposed communist hanging out with this guy that was a white Russian soldier from the Russian civil war, totally the opposite of, of the communists in many respects. And it doesn't really make sense. Let's talk a little bit about him because he figures pretty prominently in King's story as well. Yes. Uh, I've been talking enough, John, you want to, anything you want to say? Oh, I mean, no, I mean, George has always endlessly fascinated me. Like whether or not there were these, you know, even his early history, like if just, whether or not there were these pro Nazi like contingents that he had to shoot down. Um, that's right. The, the fact that, yeah, the fact that he, uh, I think it was, uh, at the time I, I could be wrong on this, but I think it was, um, uh, Dick Helms who thought that he was a Nazi sympathizer and, or an espionage agent. So it's yeah. always interesting to me when you have these people who are in the United States who are dealing with the government who get CIA watchers or FBI watchers, OSS, uh, or OSS, whatever you want to call them at the time. Uh, and they're interacting with each other. And so, especially when George decides to, you know, befriend Lee and Marina, whose father is this Russian general, like it just always seems like there is far more than friendships being um, cultivated in these situations. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely, and 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 <clears throat> uh, from that same vein, uh, how did how did Marina befriend uh, Ruth Payne and her and her husband Michael with their own uh, fingerprints, intelligence fingerprints all over the mm-hmm. place? But yeah, with with George in particular, uh, you're talking about somebody who uh, wasn't in intelligence with just one country; he was in with at least three. So he he has this this experience of of espionage and intelligence work. And he and he suddenly becomes across this ex marine, um, you know, lover of the Soviet Union and quote unquote defector. You know, twenty four years old. His uh, his own ideology is contradictory and and a little muddled. But here he takes him in, and he's basically his mentor. Um, and I would not be and surprised you, if it was George. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, and you have this uh, again, Warren Commission uh, testimony where George and his wife, you know, are looking at the Oswalds, are walking around the Oswalds' house, and they find a rifle in the closet. Right. And there's a, there's a joke where, uh, you know, George says to Oswald, are, are you the one that shot at General Walker? So, I mean, right. uh, it's just the most manufactured soap opera that you can, you can ever hope to imagine. Yeah. Yeah, but of course, then when they asked George the important question of, you know, you're you're in, you've been in the military, you're you're in intelligence, you know weapons. Was it a six point five millimeter Mount Carcano? No, it wasn't. Hmm. Well, that was a little glossed over. Hmm. So, so there are only two people who actually saw the rifle. That would be Marina and George DeMorenschild. Right. George said it wasn't. Uh, an Italian, you know, a surplus World War II Italian surplus rifle, but Marina said it was. So, you know, um, but yeah, and, contradictory and, and information, contradictory information, yeah. and just like I said with all the other witnesses, the the testimony that he gave, the questions that he asked, and he, and again, a seasoned intelligence man, what is he going to do? He is going to answer only those questions that he's asked. He's not going to volunteer anything. Mm-hmm. But but the the feeling was that he was in fact going to volunteer quite a bit when the House of Representatives reinvestigated Kennedy's assassination in 1977 and 1978. 
and he was called to testify. But then he killed himself before he could. Yeah. And and again, under very dubious circumstances. What was it said that he how he killed himself? I've, I've forgotten. Did you shoot yeah, a himself? Yeah, shotgun okay. in, his, in his mouth. Ah, uh, okay. which is not easy to do. Yeah. Yeah, one of those, huh? <laughs> yeah. Very for, for Kurt Cobain of him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But I don't think yeah, Kurt, Kurt Cobain was going to be testifying anytime soon. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's some weird, yeah. there's some weirdness with that one too. But that's a whole other podcast. Well, but, uh, no, absolutely, absolutely. It, yeah. But I, I think we 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 lost we lost uh, an, an amazing uh, amount of of background as far as Oswald is concerned with the loss of George Demore and Shield. And I think that right. that we could have learned quite a, quite a bit, but. A lot of people have a lot of people have typified him as Oswald's handler, in a way. Which, which, yes, absolutely. But, but let's not forget that that he probably wasn't the only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say some so, of the things that were going on in New Orleans were were like that as well. Which brings me nice segue there into the Garrison investigation. Okay, because yes. I think it's really the Garrison investigation that probably really. Brings a lot of national inten- attention to an alternate theory, other than the Warren Commission. And well, hey, quite frankly, uh, it was the only thing yeah. that brought you know to the national attention. And my, uh, you know, we had to wait. We had to wait until the movie JFK until it was it was brought into the national attention again. But yeah, right, right. It, it was it was incredibly important. Garrison, and just, and really quick, real, really quickly before we get into Garrison, because sure. that is important when we when we talk about it being brought into the, like the national spotlight in was sixty six. Is that is that when the investigation I think started in sixty six? Correct. Yeah, well, he he started in in sixty six, sixty seven, and brought right. Uh, you know, uh, uh, charged and brought brought. Um, the right. uh, the charges against him in sixty eight, and then the trial was in sixty nine. Yeah, Clay Shaw. Yeah. But I, and I, yeah, and I think that what's important is that that national again, just because of where we still are in twenty sixteen, that national kind of media thing. You know, we also really we we glossed over uh, you know for a singular reason to get the garrison, who's far more important. But you know, if you do look at you know for as much as people want to laugh at it, the fact that Dorothy Kilgallen in nineteen sixty four was writing about kind of the assassination and right. you know trying to do what little she could against uh, a major governmental machine but still you know i think she was dead two years by the time that garrison's uh, trial had started yes yeah. yeah she would have been an incredibly important uh, witness had 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 um had she lived and helped garrison yeah she, you know, she released she Ruby's, mysterious, she, mysteriously too of course yeah, yeah. and and, and 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 she released, you know, um, I think it was uh, Ruby's diaries a month before they were released to the press. Hmm. Well, yeah, she, well, she had she had interviewed uh, Ruby in prison, and and had yet to and had yet to write um, the you know the article about her her dealings with Ruby and what she, right. what he had to say. But, um, but yeah. Uh, now the movie JFK, Oliver Stone's JFK, was was based loosely on um, one aspect of Jim Garrison. I mean, you read the literature on Jim Garrison, and there are so many aspects of the man, uh, and and uh, you know his ethics and you know things like that. But <clears throat> um, Oliver Stone was never out to deify Garrison. It was simply this was one perspective, and of course the important perspective because he was the only person to ever bring a trial in the assassination of President Kennedy. So that was historic. That was important. Right now, the methods that he that he used, uh, yes, some could be absolutely called into question. Uh, but I think the most important thing to remember is that regardless of how he did it, regardless of how. Um, uh, detrimental it was to Clay Shaw and his life and his reputation. When the trial was over, uh, in the movie, they, they had a juror say this, but it was in fact the judge that presided over the case that said, Jim Garrison proved beyond any doubt mm-hmm. that President Kennedy was re- killed as a result of a conspiracy. Mm-hmm. He simply failed to prove that Clay Shaw had anything to do with it. 
And you know, I think that that's actually right because because I've read uh, Garrison's book and I've you know studied some about the case, and I I really honestly think that what was whatever was happening in New Orleans probably had nothing to do with the Kennedy assassination. That it might have just been some other mission that Oswald was on and it had to do so some other kind of dirty tricks that the CIA was pulling down there. It, 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 that could have very well been. Yeah. Absolutely. And Clay Shaw, David Ferry, they were all part of this and they just kind of got pulled in because later, you know, Oswald becomes the patsy. Right. Well, well, look what Garrison was up against. I mean, yeah. you're up against, you're up against um, a, a government that, 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 that had, a, you know, that was aggressively pushing um, the idea of a, of a lone assassin. And you're up against everyone whose reputation they had to protect, mm-hmm. which is the FBI, the Secret Service, even the Dallas police, uh, certainly, the, you know, the CIA. Um, they had reputations at stake here. And so this is what you're up against. You're up against trying to prove that the government, through certain agents and agencies, Conspired to kill President Kennedy. That's that's a monumental task and one that that is not for the faint of heart or for anyone who 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 really you know likes their career or likes their life. You know what I mean? <clears throat> uh, Jim Garrison lost a lot in pursuit of this, but he was he was driven um, to make any connection that he could. Now he had no money. He didn't really have a reputation. He's a DA from from Orleans Parish, right? right. Right. Um, the, the, the media is, is piled up against him. So, you know, certainly the government is as well. And he's got to string together this case and he's going to make as many connections as he can, you know, regardless of how tenuous those connections are. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think that in that in his heart of hearts, that's really what he was going after was he was going after bringing this back to the national consciousness and proving to a jury uh, that this was a conspiracy, that right. this was just a stepping stone. This was the first step in trying to get to the truth. Right. Because regardless of whether or not Clay Shaw was found guilty, that would not have made any difference. Yeah. They still would have had to pursue something else. They still would have had to pursue, okay, well, who was he working for? Who was he working with? Yeah. You know, who were the actual assassins? So the question still remained and would have been pursued. So, so, um, the fact that he used the power of subpoena, and which, of course, people turned down. I mean, he called everyone to testify, everyone in the government that had anything to do with it, including J. Edgar Hoover, and, of course, they all turned it down. Well, how, how do you turn down a, a, a lawful subpoena? Yeah. It, it's not an imitation RSVP, please. <laughs> it's, I got a judge to issue the subpoena. You are, to, you are compelled to appear in court. Well, they didn't. Yeah. Then, of course, all of the other subpoenas that, that, he, that he made with, for evidence. It was in that courtroom that those 12 jurors saw for the first time the Zapruder film. All right? And I think that that, that right. went a long way in proving that it was a conspiracy. And then, of course, uh, the x-rays and the autopsy photographs, which were denied, but other important documents and photographs and films were, in fact, released in that courtroom. So that again, that was a monumental, important step, and and I think you know went a long way in in um, bringing the case back to the national consciousness and 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 proving once and for all that it, it was in fact a conspiracy. John, what are your views on the Garrison case? I'm right there with Craig. I think that Garrison went in knowing that there had been a flawed investigation of the Kennedy assassination that people were. It was falling into the backs of people's minds. They didn't realize the enormity of what had happened, that there had been a coup in the side of America, and that he needed to find a way to start the wheels rolling again. And so he, start, he starts this case with what he has, and, and he uses everything and that he is available to him and some things outside of what we would perceive as normal to... Yeah, extra, extra legal. Yeah, exactly. Extra legal, yes. Yeah, to... to to find the the link that would start cases after his. Um, I, I don't think that he ever thought that he was going to get a conviction, but I did. I do think that Garrison firmly believed 
that if, if this court case started and he could start getting information and start connecting the lines that the Warren Commission had refused to do, that someone would pick up the mantle and run with it. And that by this Absolutely. time, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be having this discussion. I don't I don't think that he I think that he thought that he succeeded in starting to change the, the, the American mindset. I mean, which he has. If you look at national public polls, even to this day, the majority of Americans do not think that Oswald was a lone assassin. Um, it's in the mindset there has still never been a trial for it. I mean, That's you right. know, for as much as for as much as you want to, you know, as much as every November 22nd, people watch documentaries and you hear Oswald guilty, guilty, guilty. No court ever mm-hmm. found him guilty. No jury ever found him guilty. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do think Garrison tried to do what was in his heart, which was kickstart America back to realizing that something had happened while they were asleep. And, you know, yep. the, the government, the, the the CIA, FBI, whoever, tried to really smear him. They tried to destroy him. I, three years ago, even, even to this day, it's still being done. Because three years ago, I watched uh, the CNN documentary that they had as part of the 60s, which was this around yes, the 50th yes. anniversary. And it was yep. all just a big apology for the Warren Commission. But they got to Garrison. And even then, they're smearing him. Yep. Talking about the tactics that he used and how he was you know, basically crazy and all these kind of things. And I'm thinking, Mike, for God's sakes, the guy has been dead for over a decade. You just talk about kicking somebody when they're down, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Un- well, again, it's, unbelievable. It's, it's, we, have to, we have to continue that narrative. And that narrative yeah. uh, that, that, that not only Garrison uh, brought to us in 68 and 69, but also, once again, you know, uh, reemerged with, with Oliver Stone. And I just think it was very interesting that Oliver Stone chose um, Jim Garrison as, yeah. as, as the, the vehicle to, to show. And again, I think people mis, misinterpreted what even Oliver Stone was trying to do, um, as if to say that every single... Um, person or a agency that was listed or that was named in the movie was indicted, and that's not what Garrison was saying. It was not this this big amalgam of all these people getting together, you know, uh, at the Palace of Armand Hills and all conspiring to kill and cover up, you know, kill President Kennedy and cover it up. It was through Garrison's investigation; these were the avenues that some of the evidence took. So it wasn't all of them did it or did it at once, but here's who could have done it. Here is who had the means, the motives, and the opportunity. Because they never said that about Oswald. Because right. Oswald was, was dead and it was a whole lot easier just to, to, to uh, you know, convict him behind closed doors and, uh, you know, on paper. But to take your analogy, Craig, and I, 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 I completely agree with you, I think that... When you look at that analogy of uh, an arena-sized stadium filled with people and Garrison in the middle of it, I think that Garrison was truly in that mi- in the middle of an arena of people and said, "Listen, we all here know what happened, but someone in here, one of you, knows what happened. One of you. Yeah, I've collected yeah. all the people and information, and one of you knows. And I think uh, again, the misinterpretation of JFK Oliver Stone's film for any criticisms I have of Stone." I think that Stone does the same thing. Here, here is the arena full of people. I don't know. Right. They all know something happened, but someone in this movie knew what happened. Yeah. That's right. Because all of them either destroyed evidence, withheld evidence, still to this day withholding evidence, uh, blocked evidence, or, like I said, had more motive than Oswald. You have to realize we've had four presidential assassinations. And, and the assassination of JFK was the only one in which the government could not pin a motive to the assassin. Right, right. They never could say why he did it. In fact, all of the evidence uh, is to the contrary, that he was admirer of Kennedy, that he had no animus against Kennedy. Whereas mm-hmm. the other three political the other three political assassinations were for you know outright political reasons. They they had yeah. no qualms about it. Um, but when you when you when you realize that the director of the CIA, who was fired by President Kennedy over the Bay of Pigs, now sat on the investigative committee mm-hmm. for his assassination, mm-hmm. that stinks to high heaven right there. And was it the mayor of Dallas, the brother of another guy that Kennedy had fired from the CIA? Yes. 
He uh, was the second guy. Yeah, the the two guys that he that Kennedy had fired over the Bay of Pigs. Mm-hmm. General Charles Listen. Cabell was the brother Listen, of we- Earl Cabell, the mayor of Dallas. Hmm. Listen, we all know that Oswald did it because he was a happily married, bridge playing, well liked former veteran or former military yep. man, loner psychopath. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Very stable, yeah. Well guys, let's let's talk about the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Uh you know, this is the this is what that doc that documentary that I was telling you about just kind of conveniently glo- glossed over yeah, that there ever that this, there ever was this this uh this house that the that the federal government through the Congress actually did investigate and actually came up with interesting conclusions. So let's talk about yeah. some of those conclusions. Well, I, I, again, I, I want to go back to the, to, the, to the impetus of the investigation. The only reason that that investigation went forward was because of Robert Groden, who was a photo analyst who had, in fact, been uh, um, recruited by Jim Garrison got a hold of a copy of the Zapruder film out of the National Archives because a Secret Service copy was put in there. So like a third generation um, Secret Service copy was in the National Archives and Robert Groden somehow bootlegged it and then showed it in 1975 on Geraldo Rivera's program, Good Night America. Mm-hmm. And it was because of that that the House of Representatives, uh, I believe it was um, Representative Schweitzer, who said there is absolutely no way that Oswald did this and did this alone, just based on that film. And it was grainy yeah. and it was black and white. You know, the original is in color. And also the keep in mind, was in black and white. Also keep in mind that this is post <laughs> post Watergate, and this a lot of stuff. So a lot of stuff right, was church, coming out. Absolutely, yeah. the Church Committee had already done had already come out with that. The Rockefeller Commission had already come out with with with. Um, uh, extra legal uh, activities that both the FBI and the CIA had been conducting for years and, and at that point at currently. And so there was now a turning of public sentiment about their uh, unquestioned confidence in our institutions. So it was a lot easier for representatives in the House of Representatives to, to suggest that they reinvestigate. Now, interestingly enough, they also decided to investigate, not reinvestigate, but investigate for the first time King's assassination, Martin Luther King's assassination. Right. It had never been investigated. I mean, the FBI did, but no report was released. So, so it was a, a, a reinvestigation into Kennedy's assassination and a, a and a official investigation into into uh, Martin Luther King's assassination. Why Where they were Kennedy's <laughs> assassination wasn't investigated as well is beyond me, but, you know, <clears throat> but the, the, of course, the most surprising, uh, conclusion of the House Select Committee assassinations that, that, um, rendered their report and opinion in 1979 was that there was in fact a fourth shot, hence a conspiracy. Someone else was behind the picket fence, fired one shot, which missed the motorcade. So by definition, it was a conspiracy, even though, they couldn't identify that person, nor could they link that person with Lee Harvey Oswald. So mm-hmm. basically they said the Warren Commission was essentially correct that Oswald did it and did it alone with three shots. Uh, but there was another shooter behind the picket fence and fired one shot. Mm-hmm. So one of the things still were, but it, but it was still it inadequate was still to, yeah, still Oswald. Yes. The other thing is, is that, that the medical panel, that finally studied the x-rays and the autopsy uh, photographs and the report that uh, Dr. Humes had not burned, um, and grilling Dr. Humes on the stand for the first time, um, they concluded that Dr. Humes had gotten the entry wound to President Kennedy's head wrong by four inches. Mm -hmm. So... You're basically telling a pathologist on the stand, you can't measure. Well, he couldn't, you know, not only that, but he, he, there were, there was very few procedures that he did that were correct anyway. So, uh, that was just one, one of the the telling things that came out of, out of the review of the autopsy materials and the testimony of Dr. Hmm. 
So, but unfortunately, the House Select Committee, Committee on Assassinations basically died before it even began. Right. The 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 commission, the committee that that survived and rendered its its report two years afterwards was a shadow of what had originally been set up. Uh, they had cha- they changed chairman. Uh, Richard A. Sprague was supposed to be the chairman of the House of Lincoln House Assassinations, and they fired him because he was going to delve into areas that they didn't want to get into, like the CIA, like Oswald's uh, connection to the CIA, to uh, the Marine, uh, the Marines, what he was doing in uh, at Sugi, Japan. You know, they were they were actually going to do their job. They were going to follow the leads that the Warren Commission never did. And that was, that was not considered, you know, uh, a priority. So uh, they got a new chairman, and basically the, the, the investigation took a, a completely different uh, direction. And not to be long and we, about this. Go ahead, John. I was just going to say, and to, I just wanted to get your point in because of what you were saying about where they were looking and, and things that we actually know now. Because, you know, they didn't want to look into those connections between uh, the Oswald and the CIA and what the CIA might have been doing in New Orleans, too, with Castro to kill him. Mm-hmm. And right. it's only been recently with new, with stuff that's been declassified that we've seen, I think, a year ago or two years ago, that we know that the CIA was hiding evidence from the Warren Commission because it dealt with uh, investigation or it dealt with plots to the, what the mafia and the CIA working together were doing right. to, to take Castro out of power. Right. Absolutely. And this being, you know, with the Warren Commission, with an inside man on the Warren Commission, he was supposed to be the liaison. He was the one who was supposed to, you know, bridge that gap between the Warren Commission and the CIA. So if the Warren Commission wanted something from the CIA, there was Alan Dulles saying, oh, yeah, they, they'll give it to you. And here it is, without any question, right? But, but now we know, 50 years later, that they withheld very, you know, incredibly important information that Dulles knew about and didn't care that he was not giving to his, his counterparts on the Warren Commission. Um, and it, 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 it effectively uh, squashed or, or quashed the, the investigation or where that aspect of the investigation, investigation could have gone. Well, the CIA and the FBI were no more cooperative in 1978 than they were in 1963 and 64. So, again, you have... Um, the investigators who wanted to do their jobs, but who were blocked by it. One of the interesting things was they wanted to delve into what was Oswald doing in Mexico City at the at the Soviet consulate in Mexico City, because the Warren Commission used that as uh, to prove that Oswald was looking for a way back to the Soviet Union, that he was in fact a full fledged communist, and that he was working on behalf of the Russian Russian intelligence. Right? Yeah. So, so we have Oswald at all these places, like John said, in New Orleans, uh, being an anti-communist, uh, and then you have him in Mexico City trying to get to Cuba and then get back to the Soviet and then Union. They, and then they well, had that picture of him in Mexico City that they said was of him, but it was obvious some, some other dude, because it didn't even look remotely like him. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They got 24-hour surveillance. They said that this was Oswald, and, and, it, and it certainly is not Oswald. So there's yeah. no proof. But they had he, was, he was also a, he, he was also a psychopath master of disguise is what we were never told that was left out of the report as well. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that, that was one of the classes he took in the Marines. Yeah, yep, they were teaching him Russian. They were teaching him how to speak Russian and how to be a master of disguise. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. So he could be Rasputin. Uh, yeah, so yeah, so so uh, Edwin Lopez uh, was was the lead investigator of Oswald's trip down to Mexico City, and his report, his two hundred page report. Uh, was withheld from the uh, from the volumes of the House Select Committee on Assassinations, and it was just recently, I think, within the last ten years, that it was finally released. And sure as shit, sure as shit, his his conclusions was that Oswald was never in Mexico City. Mm. He wasn't looking for a way to get to Cuba. He wasn't rounding up his Astro, you know, anti Castro Cubans and wanting to overthrow Castro, then go back to Russia. And you no, know, it, it, that that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. But it was it was an example of when they had good leads to follow, that they were they were stopped, 
or the money ran out or time ran out or they were otherwise discouraged. Making any of these connections between intelligence agencies of our government and, yes, the CIA's um, plan to, to kill Castro. And there was one of the things that I, I find when we talk about this kind of obfuscation of information, uh, we were talking earlier about um, Vince Philandria, and I, I believe it was maybe four years ago or five years ago, but it was before our own Spectre died when Philandria sat down with him again. And that's right, Spectre, that's right. Arlen Inspector actually said to Philandria, you know, you, you've charged me with being corrupt and you've, you've charged me with being a fraud. And <laughs> could you at least, could you at least just change that to, I was incompetent. Mm. Okay. There you go. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Is that any better? Well, that's what they usually do is bl- <laughs> that's what they usually do is blame it on incompetence, right? Like all those right. all those quote unquote failures, the sec- all those intelligence failures that led to nine eleven, right? The quote unquote incompetence, well, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely, and 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 and, and that could be another podcast right there, nine eleven, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But well, like I said, now now again, a lot of people don't realize that one of the last things that uh, uh, George H. W. Bush did before he left office, because it was, it correlated with the release of JFK, the movie, was he signed the Kennedy Act, which basically compelled intelligence agencies who had otherwise classified documents for that last 30, you know, 25 years, uh, to release them, and he set up the Assassination Record and Review Board. So what this body would do is they would collect all of the documents that were finally released, and they would <clears throat> review them and put them in the National Archives. Now, while the Assassination Record and Review Board was not an investigative body, they did, in fact, interview people and um, compelled new evidence to be unearthed. Um, and one of the more compelling things that they found were some of the technicians at Bethesda Naval Hospital where President Kennedy's autopsy was done, and they asked some of the technicians about, because for a long time, um, 88, was it? Yeah. When, um, when, when, when the, the bootlegged autopsy photographs came out? Yeah, I think it was uh, 87 or 88. Yeah, researchers, researchers, uh, again, just like the Oswald Backyard photographs, questioned their authenticity because of the contradictions within its own photographs, within one photograph, and then when you compared all the other photographs, there were raging contradictions. So that was a point of contention for the AARB that interviewed the technicians, the photographic technicians at, uh, at Bethesda, saying, are these the x-rays that you took? and developed are these the autopsy photographs that you took and developed. And there was one um, female technician who, who, under oath, uh, because her deposition was taken, she said, absolutely not. We didn't use this kind of film. We didn't use these kind of plates. Uh, Hmm. So, again, even the authenticity of what we've even stolen, (laughs) because the government (laughs) won't release it, is in question. Well, didn't they they lose Kennedy's brain, too? Did they just lose it? Yes. Um, yeah. In, once the autopsy was was done, all of the evidence that they collected, that is the X-rays, the photographs, the microscopic slides, tissue slides, um, and President Kennedy's fixed the, the the his brain was removed and fixed in formalin and put in a jar. All of those materials were gathered up, put in a foot locker, and given to uh, Evelyn Lincoln who was Kennedy's uh, secretary. Lincoln then, of course, gave it to the Kennedy family. Okay, so the Kennedy family now has this trunk full of uh, the grotesque aftermath of their brother and husband, son's uh, murder. In 1966, they decided to give them back to the National Archives as a quote-unquote gift. But as a condition of them being deposited in the National Archives, the three original pathologists who did the autopsy had to come in and inventory everything. So they went through the inventory of the x-rays, the photographs, the slides, and oops, where's the brain? What happened to the brain? Now it's missing. Okay, well, no big deal. 
So sometime between <laughs> them packing all that stuff away and then the Kennedy family getting it, uh. the brain is missing. Now, I've said this, John knows that I've said this over and over again, what my theory about that is. In the spring of 1967, President Kennedy's grave was moved 30 feet, 30 feet from its original position. So in the dead of night, his grave was dug up and he was moved. My theory is that some of the photographs, some of the slides, and his brain were buried with him in his new position, his new grave position, so okay. that when Robert Kennedy became president, he would have all of the materials he would need to reinvestigate his brother's assassination. Because if the brain is still fixed, you can tell how many shots, how many bullets went through his brain. Right. With the autopsy photographs of the interior of his chest, you can see if the bullet did in fact, did in fact go through his back and out his neck. And the microscopic slides would show how far away the bullets were when they hit his body because of the burning around the wound margins. But, of course, uh, Robert Kennedy never made it to the White House. And so I believe those materials are, are in John Kennedy's grave. Hey, guys. I yeah, got, they're missing. I got a couple more topics I want to hit. Are you guys cool to go a little bit longer? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Sure. Uh, I want to... I want to get to E. Howard Hunt's deathbed confession. Before we get to E. Howard Hunt, can I mention one thing that I think yeah. is interesting? Sure. When the uh, when when Bush signed into law uh, the Assassination Review Board and the collection of all that information, that information uh, was collected and compiled and sent to the National Archives. I think in the late nineties, so either eighty nine or eight or ninety eight or ninety nine. Um, and obviously earlier in the, in the nineties, we got FOIA to be electronically releasable information. The, the government changed that law. What I think is interesting yes. is that within a couple of years, because of nine 11, uh, you have an addendum and you have FOIA changed again, mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. in 2000, in 2001, which restricts all the access to records of former president. So, That's right. The, uh, which isn't changed back again. I think that was Obama did that in 2009 or 10. Uh, he, he reverses that, but of course there's still the extent of 12 years for some presidential records act. So it's, it's almost like the, here's the information you can have. Okay. Now we're taking it away. Okay. Now here's the information you can have. Now we're taking it away. Right. Right. Yep. Right. <laughs> and, it, and it's almost, it's almost as if there's this understanding that there are generational gaps. When I look at it long term, it's like, okay, now we're doing the Warren Commission. Okay, now we wait 10 years. Okay, now we give you the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Okay, now we wait 10 years. Now we do the Assassinations uh, Information Board through Bush. Okay, now we take it away because of the Patriot Act. Now we'll give it back to you. And so it's almost as if, wait, wait 10 years, people will get tired of hearing of it. And yes, we might have to put up with it for a long time, but we can, we can so obfuscate the information gathering that no one will ever get to the point uh, uh, of the findings at the end. No, oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Yeah. They keep changing the rules when they, when it, when it, when it suits them or when a new record group comes out or when a new disaster, uh, catastrophe like nine 11 comes out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I, I, like I said, it's, it's for another podcast, but it's important to point out as I tell my students that nine 11 is their generation's version of the Kennedy assassination. Agreed. Because Agreed. The, the comparisons between the investigations mm -hmm. of both of those incidents are frighteningly, so frighteningly similar mm -hmm. that we didn't learn anything from the Kennedy assassination because we allowed 9-11 and that, that catastrophe of an investigation to go. Well, again, it's, uh, it's not that the people swallowed it easily. It's that even the people, even, even the families of the victims themselves saying we want another investigation wasn't enough. Right. The right. pleas of, of even the victims families wasn't enough. Um, thousands of architects and engineers and, and physicists and everyone else who has been behind the, the, the truth, truth or movement, uh, it has not been enough. So, you know, the longer we wait for that, I can't believe that it's been 15 years. And again, no new investigation. Mm -hmm. 
So how there, long will we have to wait? How long will we care? Or, or you know, when will we see these patterns, these familiar patterns, enough to say that that no, someone has to be held accountable? There's even a precursor in some ways, like the groundwork, in my opinion, was laid for nine eleven was something that. Uh, JFK absolutely refused to do, which was Operation Northwoods. Yes, yes, yep. yeah, and and here here it comes again. You know, mm-hmm. it it, it uh, resurrects itself, and it, we again we we while we may have lost some of our confidence in our institutions, we don't we no longer blindly trust them or you know intuitively just say yeah okay they're right because they are well shit they're the FBI they're the CIA. Even though we don't do that, <clears throat> we still cannot conceive as a society that our government would do anything so drastically or so drastic. Right. But then again, those who are in power like their power, and they're not going to give it up. Mm-hmm. And so when you, when, you, when you conceive of people who have this enormous power and want to keep it and who can convince themselves that 3,000 lives is a small price to pay for global... Um, you know, um, conquer right. and control. It's it's a small price to pay. And as an aside, we're seeing if Trump, for all his kind of anti-establishment uh, rhetoric, we're seeing him put at least two or three people that are that were signatures to the PNAC documents. Yeah, yeah. Woolsey yeah. and John Bolton. So time will tell on that one. But let's talk about. Uh, E. Howard Hunt's deathbed confession. What do you guys think of that? Do you think that there that there was something substantial there? <laughs> well, I think it's it's funny is that is that uh, a a seemingly strong argument against a conspiracy in President Kennedy's assassination has been has always been echoed uh, to the tune of. Well, if this many people were involved, certainly somebody would have come out and said something by now. Yeah. But of course, not taking into account all of the people who have died before they could come out and say something about it. Um, but also, they're looking for a deathbed confession. For all these years, people have been saying, well, you know, wouldn't you think that the guilty people on their deathbed would have confessed? Well, here we have a confession. And, and, and what do you think of it? Well, we think that it's, you know, he's making it up or, you know, mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's, already, it's already met with... with um, Without, I mean, what what do we have to to counter that with? Pretty much nothing. You know, yeah. uh, we see it. We and and we see it in any important any any important note in in history where something where we're waiting for someone to say on their deathbed if something is real or if something is fake, and it, it, it's as if the media knows, okay, we're going to, we're going to wait, we're going to wait. Someone's going to come out. Someone's going to come out. And then when that person does, and then when that that person does do it one way or the other, it's either not reported on or they were, or they were not lucid when they said it, or they were in the throes of pain. Um, Yeah. Dream state. He was in a dream state. Yeah. Nothing, nothing to see here. Yeah. <laughs> are are yeah, there so are I, there kids are making it up and are the kids forced them which is right. which has been an accusation that has been uh applied at St. John Hunt for that they said that the kids forced him to say that. That's right, but but, uh, but then again why? Right. Why would they sully uh the reputation of his father who for in in many in many circles is a is a true patriot regardless of, you know, what he did with Watergate and what he did for the Nixon administration and just his entire spook life. Overthrowing you know, governments. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's something to be proud of, right? He's a true patriot. But the point yeah. is, what, what, what do they get out of it? You know? Uh, so so I think that, that uh, it, it, it's got to be part of the record until, until it is scrutinized. I mean... Wasn't he always with an open mind? Wasn't he always a Howard Hunt? Wasn't he always suspected of being one of those being one of those tramps, the the hobos? Yes, yes, yes. And I and I'd say that's again one of the more, one of the more intriguing uh, aspects of the JFK assassination is that is identifying them. Yeah, and 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 to Craig's point, which I think has always fascinated me too about the deathbed confession, is whether you believe in the things that he did. Um, you know, the overthrowing of government, Watergate, and both. 
Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Okay, there? Yeah, we're here. Yeah. 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 It's that moment when, again, you know, as, as I was stating, everything he's done up until this point, he's been a good soldier. Those last 20 minutes, don't pay any attention to that. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, so he, he, he is also an incredibly interesting figure. Um, well, what do you think about what the things that he said? Because uh, it really actually, in some ways, wasn't really a deathbed con- uh, confession. I mean, he he made a couple of videos, or one audio tape, and then I think that uh, St. John actually interviewed him on video. And he right. talked about Cord Meyer and dropped yeah. a few other names. And the Cord Meyer thing is interesting to me because apparently Meyer's wife had an affair with Jay. We're having okay. an affair, yeah. So mm-hmm. I've always thought about what if... That it, it may have just become, you know, where you had another group that had an ulterior motive. They wanted to get rid of JFK for whatever reason, but they got a guy that would have an actual personal reason to want to kill him. Okay, fair enough. I'm not. Look, I'm not saying it, I am still. After all these years yeah. of researching this, I am still not uh, convinced or sold on any one theory or any one suspect. Right. I think that there are multiple ones, and I think that. Um, uh, when well, you talk about affairs, I, I mean, the, uh, an affair was also uh, has been claimed uh, as to be the culprit of the death of uh, Officer J.D. Tippett. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't Oswald that killed him. It was a guy that was having an affair with his wife who killed him. Mm-hmm. But I, so, think, so I, think that, I think I think that the, the affair and what, what you're talking about, too, I think that this is kind of the obfuscation that we understand from uh a government, right? So you have Howard Hunt saying things like, you know, Court Meyer, his wife had an affair, and there was a French gunman on the grassy knoll, and all these things like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, these are backup plans, right? So, like, what happens right. if some? What happens if somehow Oswald survives getting out of the police station? Like, where do we go right. from here? Uh, oh, well, this CIA guy's wife is having an affair with JFK. Now we can go to him. Oh, no, no. Now we can track down this French guy. He has yeah. something to do with it. Um, Good point. So, I mean. I, it, yeah, it's this. It's these backup plans in case the first. What we're seeing when we say like, "Oh, well, there's a, a wide variety of possibilities." Yes, of course, because they're not going to leave it in one instance and hope that that instance goes right. They're going to create a, a huge net and cast it out. Uh, that way, it becomes an octi- an octopus for us to research. But it, what it was is it was backup plans. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I. I- I can completely see that. Absolutely. So, in that respect, do you think that E. Howard Hunt may have even may have still just be was still a good soldier even towards the end, and he just you know put out a little bit of disinformation before he goes into the. I don't know the, if it's disinformation. World. I think he was. I think he was saying what he knew, but again, right. I don't think you know most of the people involved didn't know. I mean, that's a, how do you keep the Manhattan Project right? You compartmentalize, right? right. And so right. he 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 said what he knew. But, you know, how much do you know? And you only know unless you can get all of the pieces together. You can only see that puzzle once it's assembled, you know. Right. Let me ask you guys about another thing, and this is dealing uh, uh, closely with E. Howard Hunt, is um, Nixon's statement, the whole Bay of Pigs thing. This is stuff that... Well, I don't know if this was in the Watergate tapes or this is what was speculated to have been erased out of the Watergate tapes. But, oh no, it was it was in the tapes. But do you think that a lot of people have speculated that that was a euphemism for the the assassination? Oh, absolutely, because he wasn't talking. But you look at the context of the conversation; it had nothing to do with the Bay of Pigs. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and you know what? What was the Bay of Pigs? If even if you're using it metaphorically, what was it? It was it was a disaster. Many people were killed. Um, and then Kennedy privately took or uh, publicly took responsibility for it, but publicly uh, eviscerated the CIA, hmm. which of course, uh, which is what I believe was a, was a huge motivation for the CIA to preserve itself. Yeah, you're talking about you're yeah. talking about the CIA here, and uh, yeah. a, a young punk, a young liberal, who 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 sussed out that he was given crappy intelligence. So he said, you know what? I'm going to obliterate you guys. I'm going to, I am going to, you know, smash you to a thousand pieces and scatter those pieces to the wind. And he could have done it. Mm -hmm. You don't say that to an intelligence agency. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, um, so absolutely. I think it was, it was, um, Nixon ease. I mean, the FBI is, is, is infamous for its bureau ease. Let's call this Nixon ease. And everyone who he was talking to knew what he was referring to. 
what was the context that he was that what he was speaking in? I mean, was do uh, you think Nixon himself might have known something? Um, uh, it was it was a it it had to do with Garrison's investigation and Garrison being pointed away from Lee Harvey Oswald and towards. Uh, the intelligence apparatus of our of our government, which of course Nixon loved the intelligence apparatus of our government, especially the FBI, yeah. uh, but certainly the CIA. So when you're talking about uh, in in again in very guarded tones, who could have been responsible for it? Because that's what Garrison was trying to find out: who was involved, who would have wanted Kennedy dead, who had the means to do it, who had the motivation to do it. Yep. Now, which is why that, CIA. yeah, exactly. Which is why that Nixon quote, you know, Hunt knows too damn much. You know, going back to E. Howard Hunt, you yeah. know, because it's 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 about the intelligence gathering agencies. You know, whether or not it's about a specific event, it's about the fact that you know there there are some people who have a lot of information. They may not have it all, but you know, it, Howard Howard Hunt knows too much. He's he's going to make the CIA look bad. You know, and again, it's this kind of peacocking of the, we know we've done things wrong. We can't look bad, though. Right. <clears throat> because we have to maintain the confidence in the American public, certainly in the, you know, appropriations committees that are giving us endless money and not asking what we're doing with it. So it's it's right. like the plans that you're talking about, like, you know, MK Ultra and Norwood and <clears throat> all of the other um over operations that 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 the ones that Kennedy knew about said, "Oh, absolutely not! You're not going to do that. Not on my watch. You're not going to." You know. Mm-hmm. So here we have we even have someone who is uh, openly not trusting his advisors and not trusting the uh, the intelligence apparatus of which they trusting had, his own inner circle of which they had mm-hmm. had free reign during the Truman and the Eisenhower administrations to do just whatever the oh. hell they wanted. Oh, they they absolutely yeah. did. They absolutely did. But even Eisenhower, Eisenhower, I think, was the one who not only warned President Kennedy privately, but also yeah. all of us publicly. You right. know, his farewell address was, we cannot allow the unwarranted acquisition of the military industrial complex. You know, so that, that was his message was, Truman and I didn't do enough to to keep our, our reign on it or, or to any oversight for the CIA. As a career but, soldier, that was a hell of a statement for Eisenhower. That was a hell of a statement. Absolutely. So I think, I think that you had, you know, that, that last gasp with the Eisenhower administration and certainly the Kennedy administration that's learning its lesson and was prepared to do something about it. Mm-hmm. You know, you've, you've got this, again, this young liberal who, who is saying, okay, we tried to take Cuba over. We're not going to do that anymore. We are in fact going to, we are, you know, um, we're going to try to be friendly to Cuba and to Russia itself, you know, into the Soviet Union as well. We're, we're going to try for a more peaceful existence. And uh, that's why he was accused of being a communist lover. Right. Let's and, talk. And, and uh, want being wanted for treason. I want to talk about uh, some of the reasons, some of the reasons that you think Kennedy may have been killed. Well, I just, <laughs> I just, yeah, uh, he was, uh, yeah, too handsome. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> but could there have been other reasons besides just pissing off the CIA? Could there have been reasons like uh, trying to come to some kind of understanding with the Soviets? Could well, it have been yeah, the Federal Reserve? Was, those type oh, of things. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about I, controlling for, foreign policy. You're, ta- you're talking about controlling domestic policy as well. Like like the the Federal Reserve and getting the power back into the hands of the people as opposed to large banks or monopolies like the steel corporations. Uh, when he fixed the prices for steel, that that really pissed them off too. And then of course his 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 reticence about Vietnam, yeah, which was a huge cash cow, and and geopolitically an important strategic move for um, the military industrial complex. Not to mention so, all the heroin. Well, absolutely. That right there, that, you know. Which the CIA other, was other already than, running out through what? What was the what was the program they had where they were running heroin out of? Uh, yeah, I, I can't remember that. The, it was I can't remember the, the airplanes. Program. Yeah. But you, I mean, you yeah, look at, had, you you look at you look at the fact of 
But I mean, you, you say, you know, are there are there any aside from the intergovernment agencies or the, or the government agencies that would have a, a need or a necessity to to take Kennedy out of power? I mean, the, the logic behind it is any president right now, like whether it's Obama, Trump, Bush, any president in American history, there have been too many reasons to take that guy out of office for too many people, uh, whether it is a, a lone individual, a corporation. Um, there are already a multitude of reasons that someone wants that person out of office. And and to add to it, the protective and intelligence gathering agencies and the defense agencies and the military agencies of your own country, that just blows everything over the top. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Well, and let's, and let's look at what has happened in the wake of, of President Kennedy's assassination. The whole reason why the CIA was created was because of the, the spectacular catastrophe of intelligence prior to World War II. So then Truman says, okay, we've got to have a centralized intelligence. We've got to take uh, you know, all of these different intelligence agencies that are bucking for uh, their appropriations and their survival and not sharing information is costing us not only at home, like with things like Pearl Harbor, but also you know, overseas. So we need to centralize it. We need to centralize all of our intelligence. So we're going to have the CIA. We're going to have, you know, um, the NSA. We're going to have, now we're going to have compartmentalized and cooperative intelligence, right? How many intelligence agencies do we have now? <laughs> yeah. And that's not we what have, happened. <laughs> we have 16. 16. Yeah. So, so, you know, here, you know, you're talking about, you know, you know, the Republicans not wanting large government or government out of our back, you know, off our backs and out of our lives, but certainly not when they're talking about foreign policy, maybe domestic policy or they're talking about it, but certainly not foreign policy. So, so I think that, uh, President Kennedy's policies, or at least his ideas, I think he was pretty tame in his first three years before he was assassinated, and I think it was his the, the, the prospects of another four years that scared the living shit out of a lot of people mm-hmm. who were in power. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, we're talking about intelligence agencies. We're talking about the defense Depar- or the uh, the uh, uh, Department of Justice, because what was Kennedy using them for as an arm for much of 1963 was for civil rights. So he was, so it was changing, he was changing his attitudes, not quite as quickly as a lot of Americans would have liked him to, but ultimately he would have, and would have changed the, just the complexion of the United States. Uh, and, like you said, from, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, Craig, to, to go along with your point too, and I think one of the things that we missed too is, aside from all of the enemies that Kennedy might have made corporate uh, economic, geopolitical, military, or otherwise, you know, the other specter that looms in the background of which uh, m- many, many people were even more worried about was the fact that this was going, that Kennedy was, Kennedy's presidential um, stay was going to be handed over to Bobby. You know, right. you have that standing in the background is, is Robert Kennedy, who is ready to take this country in a very different place. And, right. and, and so, you know, there is that motive behind that sits behind there too, looming like a specter. Yeah. The, 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 the prevention of a dynasty. I mean, we, they were already, Kennedy was already being talking, talked in terms of Camelot or royalty that, that, that the Kennedys even to this day are described as America's only Royal family, even today. And, and I think, yes, it scared the shit out of a lot of people, but that prospect of having a Kennedy in office from 1960 to 1980 yeah. with John serving eight years, Robert serving eight years, um, Edward serving eight years. That, that, yeah, I think that scared the shit out of a lot of people. <laughs> That's an interesting <laughs> perspective. Uh, one final, yeah. one final yeah. question guys, before we, we end this. And that is, do you think we're ever going to know, do you think that anything is ever going to come out? That's going to say conclusively that, Kennedy was killed because of because of this, and it wasn't Oswald. Or do you think they'll just announce it one day, and most everybody will be dead, and everybody will just go yeah, about right. their business? Well, that that was that was the whole uh, modus operandi for for the Warren Commission and even for the House Select Committee on Assassinations, classifying their their findings 
for 75 years so that whoever was involved would be dead. That was, that was, you know, that was, uh, deliberate. Um, but no, because I, because here it is. I mean, we're looking for a deathbed confession or we're looking for that piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people, uh, misunderstand how our intelligence apparatus works. Not everything goes on paper. Not every piece of paper is kept. So even if it was at one point put on paper, it's long gone. But I think the best that we can hope for now is that we definitively look, there are consensuses that we can, that we can come to, whether it's the evidence itself, the ballistics evidence, we can exonerate Oswald. And in my mind, that unfortunately is almost as good as we can get besides the, the assassins themselves coming out and saying we did it or, or definitive proof that the Corsican mafia did it or, you know, who the shooters were because it, it's been long said by researchers that we don't care who the shooters were. We want to know who paid for the bullets. So we have a lot of different researchers with different uh, priorities as far as what kind of truth they want. Uh, and quite frankly, for me personally, it's an exoneration of Oswald. It's, it's a, an indictment of the Warren Commission and, of course, the House Select Committee on Assassinations so that we can at least learn from the mistakes of allowing those kind of investigations to go and to go unimpeded and unquestioned. Um, as we look at things like the Iran Contra scandal or even more contemporarily, uh, 9-11 as a historian, I'm concerned with learning the patterns of the past. That's the only way we're going to learn from it and not tolerate it when it happens again. Because again, if we had paid attention to the political assassinations from the 1960s, and even Kent stayed into the 70s, we would have known instinctively as a society when 9-11 happened that something really went wrong, and we would not have tolerated the, the uh, report that was given. You know, um, and I'm, with, I'm, I'm obviously with you, Craig. I, I think that the best that we can do is perhaps clear Oswald of the charges, but, but more importantly, to understand the nature of history and the things that are done without our consent and with our right. unwilling consent, um, I, I, I think that by saying, will we ever know really what happened is uh, akin to saying, uh, I, I can see, I can see, I can imagine a point in the future of talking about the Kennedy assassination with some degree of, of fact, but it's the fact yeah, exactly. that I... But, it, but it's the fact that I talk about, it's the, it's the same facts that we talk about the assassination of Julius Caesar now. Uh, right, Rome, right. Doesn't exi- Rome doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a note in the annals of history. Uh, right. we, we, talk, we talk about it now, but it, we're so far removed. The institutions no longer exist. The people no longer, the countries no longer exist. Um, right, right. That's, that's how far in the future it will be discussed as a, as a point of fact. But, but for anyone in our modern day and age, I think the best that we can do is, is look at our history. We live in such a weird, fluidic time, and, and, and history is fluid by nature. It's always changing according to new information, new testimony. Yeah, to, yeah. New, yeah. yeah new witnessing. And, and, and we're supposed to watch that fluidity like waves on the ocean and know when the next one is going to crash. Hmm. Right. Well, I mean, and, and to illustrate my point, what was one of the more recent uh, revelation, re- revelations of the uh, Lincoln assassination? Well, shit, that was 150 years ago, and what was the best we could do there? Well, at least the name of Dr. Mudd, who was convicted of conspiracy, his family fought all those years to clear his name of being involved in that conspiracy. So... I do think that there's something good that can come out of even how many years later. I mean, we got a conviction, uh, you know, 35, 40 years after Medgar Evers' assassination. Right. You know, so it's important that, that, we, that we not let these things simply uh, slip into the annals of history and be forgotten, except as a quaint anniversary whenever we can think about it. It is really important that we, we take... We make sure that our institutions are held to a higher standard and we take them to task whenever they fail, especially when they fail at 
investigating things that are so important, so detrimental to history itself, that can actually alter history and 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 how it goes forward. So, um, yes, I want to exonerate Oswald. I want to see if my theory is correct. So let's have let's exhume President Kennedy's body. Let's exhume uh, Governor Conley. You know, and see what evidence is there, and see what we can still you know because I. From the from the technicians that I spoke to, who were there the night of the autopsy, they embalmed him for three hours. I mean, they reconstructed his head. He could have had an open casket if the family had wanted it, which I think is just amazing. Um, so I think that that while maybe all the skin isn't there, I think he would have he he would be preserved enough that there was there's still evidence to be uh, to be extracted. Um, and yeah, just put some of these. Uh, the, the the larger questions of this assassination uh, into fact as mm-hmm. opposed to theory, and and if that's the best we can do, then I mean <laughs> the the legacy of John Kennedy demands it demands something more than what we've already given him. Absolutely, you know, this is a man who, was, who had his his head blown off in front of his wife in midday in an American city. You know, is it too much to ask that that we we cut out some of the bullshit and we come to a consensus. Agreed. And and to a personal note, which Craig taught me a long time ago, is to look at things through a personal perspective and and kind of even just a single person's motivation. Uh, we live in a country where people are presumed innocent until proven guilty. And at some point, it would be nice if Rachel Oswald could go to sleep knowing that her father Absolutely. wasn't wasn't. Uh, the murderer of the president of the United States. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very well said. Well, gentlemen, uh, I think that's it. But before we go, each one of you, what's new for you guys? And John, I understand that you kind of bringing realm of the weird back. Cause I saw uh, that you posted something for the first time in five years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It took five years to get four more stories. So they'll, yeah, they'll, 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 <laughs> Listen, if I wanted to make this shit up, excuse me, if I wanted to make this stuff up, I could put it out every week, right? But I'm 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 looking for weird things to happen. It took uh, five years for four more things to happen. So there'll be four more episodes of Realm of the Weird coming out. And if people want to see where I'm lecturing, they can go to weirdlectures.com. There's an events page and all of the places I'll be, will be at that. Excellent. And Craig, yourself, what, do you, what are you working on? You're still working on the <laughs> well, uh, mega, uh, not, uh, Fred Hampton book? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm still hoping that uh, that the work that I did for um, <clears throat> the filmmaker out of New York um, will get some funding, and uh, and that his project can go through. Then I can, you know, be his consultant on the film and finally get paid for all the work that I did for him already for free. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I, I'd like to go forward with a book. Um, I'd, I'd like to try to, to actually uh, collaborate with the last uh, scholar who wrote a book on um, on Fred Hampton, uh, The Ballad of the Bullet, uh, who did some, some groundbreaking and wonderful work on uh, on Fred Hampton and the Illinois Black Panther Party, but, but he doesn't know who I am, so I, I'd like to be able to introduce him and say that, hey, look, I have I have documentation that you do not have and didn't have for your book, so let's do a second volume and bring our work together and, and, and hopefully produce something. So, so I'm in the midst of, of trying to contact him and see if we can't get a collaborative effort to bring, uh, not only the, the assassination of Fred Hampton back to the, to the national consciousness, but also the, the life and the work of Fred Hampton, whose, whose legacy is today just as important as it was back in 1969 with the black lives matter, with, with the scores of, of, of innocent black people being, being um, executed by, by the state, which Fred Hampton was in 1969. So I think it's, it's relevance is, is, is obvious. So. We need Fred more than ever. <laughs> absolutely. Well, guys, at least absolutely. his words and dreams. Well, guys, thank you so much uh, for being no, on. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. Anytime, guys. Anytime. You're both welcome. Well, I, there's so much that we could talk about. <laughs> we could go for five, six hours on this stuff, honestly. <laughs> but uh, stay on the line for us, guys. We're going to close this section out, and we will be back with a very brief a- outro on Conspiracy Normal. Thanks, Adam. All right. Thanks, Adam. Hey, thank you, guys.
All right, everybody. Welcome back to Conspiracy Normal. I don't know about you, but my mind is blown. I spent another episode on Wikipedia and Google trying to keep up with the conversation. <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> just so many That's references. What you're doing? <laughs> yeah. There's, well, I mean, this is um, this it's it's a subject that like it's always interested me, but I haven't delved into it nearly, obviously, nearly as deep as you or, or John or Craig have. And uh, well, it's just, at least you weren't watching like pictures of boobs or skate videos like Luke. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to keep up. But it's, <laughs> It is just that it's it's such a, a vast, broad yes. topic, and there's so much to it that it's I just I get lost in it all, and I mean the amount of evidence is staggering. But um, one thing we we didn't touch. I'm glad you brought it up because we didn't really touch on it much until the end. Is something that always interests me with any kind of conspiracy is who it is that stands to to sort of benefit, you know, because that's generally where you can safely lay the blame. Um, I don't think that this was just some random crazy person that decided to to take out yeah. John F. Kennedy. I think we can all agree that there's definitely a lot more to it than the official story. So um, I kind of like to hear you ask them about it, but I kind of like to hear what you kind of think. About uh, what my theory of it is? Yeah, like who who do you think was more the, most likely behind it or who stood to benefit most from his death? Um, I think who stood to benefit probably would have been the overall military industrial complex um uh, it, possibly people that were more on wall street those people that spent that that would have lost a lot of money had we not gone into vietnam because even though we you know we say that we lost vietnam there's still a lot of money and material and men that got poured into it and people a lot of people got got rich i mean if you look at the history of the cold war basically from the beginning the cold war was in some ways a ways to continue the war footing that we had been on in world war ii uh the fears of not going into a depression um and there was a huge economic there was a lot of fears right after World War II in the immediate post war years, forty five, forty six, forty seven, that we might go back into that. And then all of a sudden we found the big bad boogeyman of the Soviet Union and we could say or we could justify keeping the military expenditures going on and this eventually moved into things like the military industrial complex. Um and if Kennedy had decided a, not to go into Vietnam, and B, to possibly end the Cold War decades before it actually did end, and with the Soviets completely dismantled and dissolved, basically, then I think that it would have been people that would have, would have stood to have lost a lot of money. And then there were probably lower-level people that were generally genuinely pissed off at Kennedy like the anti-Castro Cubans that he felt like had betrayed them at the Bay of Pigs, those guys. Um, There were also some of the generals that felt like Kennedy should have invaded uh, Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, which if he had probably would have sparked nuclear war. Yeah, I (laughs) think that was handled pretty much the way it should have been. Yeah. At least in hindsight. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that changed Kennedy... I think that changed Kennedy's mind about a lot because really in 1960, when he ran for president, he was coming up with all these things about the missile gap, about how uh, the Soviets were so far ahead of us in ICBMs and other missiles, when in fact they only had nine that could actually reach the United States. Um, But Kennedy didn't know that. And Nixon actually did being a part of the the administration because he was Eisenhower's vice president that but Nixon couldn't say anything about it. So in the debates Kennedy talked about the missile gap and that's one of the reasons why he won. But so he was kind of a more of the, he was kind of more on the cold war you know cold war hawkish side but I think the Cuban missile crisis changed his mind and he began to talk about more closer cooperation with the Soviet Union. He gave that speech in summer of 1963 I think at American University where he talked about um, you know, in the end, we all cherish our children. We all have this one world to to be in. And he was looking very internationalist. And he did make steps towards the Soviet Union, like the Test Ban Treaty in 1963, where they 
ban the 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 testing on, on the surface of nuclear weapons. Uh, so there were all these moves that were being made, and I think that uh, some people did not like that, could not see. And we mentioned Alan Dulles. You know, Alan Dulles is somebody that you know if you look into him, there's a ton of. That's that. That's like that's another rabbit hole to go into because the guy had so many connections uh, with all these banking firms in New York City that uh, banks that propped up the Nazis um, had all this uh, Nazi uh, connections even in the war when he was in the OSS, uh, which was the World War II version of the CIA. Right, uh, and then his brother. John Foster had been Eisenhower's Secretary of State and was very much, these guys are very much, you know, anti-communist, almost fascist to a degree. And that that kind of fascism uh, runs pretty well, pretty, it's pretty well, pretty, there's a pretty well good stream of it all throughout the 20th century and even into the 21st, as I think we're probably seeing now. But that's another digression. <laughs> well, you also uh, mentioned the um, the Federal Reserve, and mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken, there was other presidents who were assassinated yeah. who had a similar belief. I, I had uh, I had heard some things about that. That's 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 the one that's kind of tangent tangential for me because I'd heard some things that like that Kennedy actually wanted to start printing his own mm-hmm. money. Uh, they wanted to start printing money that was not backed by the Federal Reserve, and apparently there actually were some of these bills made that did not say Federal Reserve note, like all your money says. Mm-hmm. Now, whether or not that had anything to get to with, with him being killed, who knows? But I, I think part of it, too, was that, you know, he did probably just, he probably just took on a power structure that was too big for him, and he ended up probably being killed for it. And like I said before, I mean, if, E. Howard Hunt, if what he was saying was the truth and this guy Cord Meyer was involved, then they got a guy to do it that actually had an actual personal reason to kill JFK because JFK was having sex with his wife, of which she later died under um, mysterious circumstances. And as Adam Go Rightly pointed out on this show, she was the one that gave JFK LSD. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other. That's a whole other connection. So, yeah, I mean, I I, I think any time thing, it, you know, that would be what would be interesting to see with Trump, to see if he actually begins to because he himself is a bit of an outsider, kind of like JFK. Now they're mm-hmm. very different in substance, but in some ways their backgrounds are very similar. They would both be considered upstarts. And it would be very I'd be very curious to see how Trump if he begins to make radical changes and if he begins to rock the boat enough, then if we well, see if something would happen to, to him as well. Yeah, the thing I'm watching him for closely right now is he's he's now being briefed on all kinds of you know, all this information that you you're not yeah. privy to until you're the president elect, which obviously Hillary had already known. Um, like you mentioned the debates between Kennedy and, and Nixon and the, the discrepancies right. there. Now he's he's finally in a position to see what is actually going on globally. And I think that's going to affect a lot of his his stances and his his policies. And I think mm-hmm. we're going to see a lot of flip-flopping around from him. Yeah. I, yeah, I think so too. And, and, I, and I, think, I think really in some ways Trump is going to be more like Reagan, right? Um, because Reagan kind of had that whole anti-establishment, small government kind of thing. But he, when he became president, he stocked his cabinet up and his uh, staff up with a lot of people that were on organizations like the Council on Foreign Relations, a lot of neo, what was then kind of the nascent neoconservative movement. Uh, so, yeah, that was – I think Trump will probably be the same way. And I think that's why you got somebody like Pence – who is going to kind of be the power behind the throne, so to speak. He's going to be kind of like, I think, the new Dick Cheney in some ways, because I think he represents yeah. that more group of more establishment people, guys like I mentioned before, like Woolsey and John Bolton, guys that are, you know, PNAC, uh, Project for a New American Century, 
we need to sit down some time and go over exactly what that means, but or what that is. But I think some people know. Um, but if you got any other questions, um, no, nope, I got my research though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a rabbit hole, man. Oh, it sounds like it. It's a rabbit hole, but you know, for me, the Kennedy assassination was kind of my entry point when I was a kid to a lot of this information because the, when you look at it, there's so many connections to so many other aspects. I mean, just the CIA alone is, is a wealth of information and a wealth of connections to so much. And it, it does, it, it does, and it can tend to get complicated. Uh, next time, next week, guys, we're going to have on Ryan Sprague. We're going to talk about his book somewhere in the skies. But I think before that, we're going to have a little jam session in here. I, I did want to talk about uh, Pence going to see Hamilton, but uh, I'm going to save that for next time. So it'll be old news by the time that show actually comes out, but whatever. <laughs> so, uh, guys, thank you for listening. And Rob and I will be recording something about two in about an hour here, so I'm not going to say bye to Rob yet. So... <laughs> You stay for dinner, Adam? I, I may. You All never right. know. I might as well just camp out here. It was, might as well just live here. You want a roommate? Sure. <laughs> you have to live out here in the garage, though. Sure. Why not? <laughs> Luke would be more, more used to that than I would. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for listening, and we will be back next time on Conspiracy Normal. Conspiracy Normal.